Today's episode has been brought to you by Schedulicity. And also by Pelvic Health Professionals. This is a place where you get to connect to the most up-to-date information about pelvic health. And if you're wondering what that is, two weeks ago, I talked all about what is pelvic health and who is this for. We have some amazing guest speakers coming up. If you're listening to this in real time, as this episode releases, we just did a call with Carolyn Van Dyken about pelvic floor engagement. So we get asked all the time. How do I cue pelvic floor engagement or should I or should I not? Or how do we get yoga students to uh, strengthen their pelvic floor or my yoga students are postnatal? What do I need to know about the pelvic floor? This is the call to check out and the replay is ready for you. We'll also be talking with Shelly Prosco soon. It's an open Q&A. You're welcome to come. And in November, we're talking about marketing and really how we market to our yoga students without digging into the fears that they have. That's with Denight. And then in December, we're going to be talking all about pessaries for pelvic organ prolapse. To check all of this out, head on over to pelvichealthprofessionals.com. Hello and welcome to the Connected Yoga Teacher Podcast. I'm your host, Shannon Crow. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a Canadian who is learning what it means to live on Indigenous land here in what we call Canada, but the Indigenous land that I live on is Anishinaabek, Odawa, and Mississauga land. I've been thinking about this a lot and trying to do my best to learn connected yoga teachers, especially since in Canada, we just acknowledge the very first Truth and Reconciliation Day. And that's a big deal. It's a big deal for us as Canadians to take a look at the history that has gone on and the future going forward and to really dig in and ask some tough questions. Also, I've been sharing some random facts about me here on the podcast, and today's is that I grew up on a party line, and I wonder who out there knows what I'm talking about. My kids are floored with this concept. They cannot believe that this was ever a thing. So on a party line, as I was growing up, that meant that our neighbors also had the same phone line. So the phone would ring and there'd be a different ring for us and a different ring for our neighbor, poor Mrs. Mayor. Because I say poor Mrs. Mayor because as I got to be into my teenage years and the only phone in the house was there in our living room, <laughs> I liked to talk a lot on the phone and I could hear Mrs. Mayor picking up the phone, putting it down because she wouldn't be able to use the phone until the line was free. And the only way that you could know if the line was free was by picking it up and having a listen, (laughs) which is unbelievable. And I actually have a very good friend who had a party line up until two years ago. So I wonder if there's anyone out there who's still living on a party line. It sounds like a lot of fun until you live next door to some teenagers. I'm also a mom of three. Speaking of teenagers, I'm a yoga teacher, a podcaster, and founder of Pelvic Health Professionals. And this podcast was created for you so that each and every week you are connected to the information and inspiration that will support you as you build your very unique yoga business. Last week, we talked about bhakti yoga and kirtan on the podcast with Kamini Natarajan, What an amazing episode that was. Go back and have a listen if you haven't. This week, we're continuing this theme and we're talking about mantras and chanting in yoga. And as a white yoga practitioner who is not great at Sanskrit pronunciations, I've often wondered, how do I approach using mantra in my practice? And I think a lot of us have similar questions. Things like, what if I can't pronounce the words correctly? Does pronunciation matter? And who cares? And when is it okay or acceptable to use mantra or Sanskrit in my classes? And when is it not okay? This is why I am so excited to have Melissa Shaw joining me on the podcast to talk about all of these questions and more. 
Melissa works to make yoga accessible through yoga therapy, mentoring yoga teachers, and mantra. Melissa also utilizes her background in public health to integrate yoga into schools and clinical settings. She is passionate about bringing yoga and Ayurveda back to its roots and reclaiming representation within the wellness community. Currently, Melissa works individually with clients offering yoga therapy in the Vini Yoga tradition. She also offers weekly community chanting classes as well as pranayama classes for BIPOC, Black Indigenous People of Color. In our conversation today, we explore more about why it's important to learn more about mantra and the benefits of chanting, as well as how to navigate incorporating mantra into our practice and classes in a way that is mindful, respectful, and intentional. I learned some really cool things in this interview, and I cannot wait to share it with you. And next week, we're going to be talking with one of Melissa's teachers, Chase Bossart. And I think it's really cool how all of these episodes are sort of going together. So last week when we talked about bhakti yoga and kirtan, and then now we're talking with Melissa today about mantra, and then Chase, who is going to be talking to us about yoga texts and mentions Melissa around the topic of cultural appropriation. I just love how these all weaved in together, even though... They were done very far apart a long while ago, and I'm just kind of in awe of how they all came together. Now, before we dive in, let's hear from our sponsor, Schedulicity, with the hot tip of the week. Hello, Connected Yoga teachers. This is Allie from Schedulicity with the hot tip of the week. We've talked a lot about how Schedulicity can help your class-based business, but we know many teachers also offer one-on-one services like Thai massage. Through your Schedulicity account, you can seamlessly book and manage those services alongside your group classes and workshops. Those calendars are integrated together, so you'll never be double booked. If you create a new class that conflicts with another appointment on your schedule, a window will pop up to warn you of the exact dates and times that interfere. We've got your back, so you can take care of your clients' backs. Thank you so much, Team Schedulicity and Connected Yoga Teachers. Schedulicity has given us a coupon code. If you want to try Schedulicity out or if you're already a paying customer and you want two months of free access, we'll make sure to put the coupon code in the show notes. So you can find that over at the connectedyogateacher.com slash 242. I also want to give a shout out of thank you to Jennifer Voke. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for your note about the Conscious Marketing Workshop with Tristan Katz. Jennifer sent a note that said, wow, I just finished the recording and this was amazing. It's given me so many useful tips and tools and so much to think about. Thank you so much for putting on this event. Thank you, Jennifer, for sending this feedback and Connected Yoga Teachers, if you're still interested in getting the replay of that event that we did live with Tristan Katz, it is over on our website if you look under trainings and events and look for conscious marketing. Alrighty, let's dive in and meet Melissa Shaw and learn more about mantra. Welcome to the Connected Yoga Teacher Podcast, Melissa. It's great to have you here today. Thanks for having me, Shannon. I'm super excited that we get to talk about mantra today and your yoga journey. Is there anything else that you want to add to the introduction and let us know? I think the only other thing I would want to add is I'm just really grateful to all the teachers that came before me that have passed down this knowledge to me and, you know, continue to. And I'm also just grateful for the other South Asian teachers who are just like working really hard right now and have been to just increase representation in these yoga spaces and are just kind of paving the way for all of us. So, Thank you. So because we're going to talk about mantra today and focus on that, how did you get into this? Where did your yoga journey begin or your journey learning about mantra or practicing in any way? Tell us how that started. I don't know the exact age where I started practicing mantra or chanting. It's just so ingrained 
in our family as it is for many other (laughs) South Asian families. So I don't have like an exact memory of like, you know, sitting down and starting this practice, but I still have asthma, but I had really severe asthma when I was really young. I was diagnosed at age of two. So most of my kind of younger part of my childhood, and even actually my teenage years, I was just kind of used to being sick a lot or, you know, certain activities I couldn't do, lots of allergies, lots of like sinus colds, things like that. And so my mom, at some point, after giving me lots of like different Ayurvedic remedies and yoga practices, which I didn't know was yoga then, at some point, she's like, enough's enough. Like you need to make this a regular part of your life for it to really help your asthma and all of that. So she started sending my sister and I to a family friend's house who would teach classes after school. And they were, it wasn't just a kid's class. It was like adults and kids. And I was probably 11 or 12 at the time, maybe 11. And my sister was a couple years older. So we started practicing that. We would do a traditional Hatha yoga practice, a couple of hours, meditation, pranayama, everything. And that's where I really started to get into more of a regular practice. And also we would, of course, practice at home, but the practice was really not, you know, do your Surya Namaskar, which when you're a kid, asana is really the main practice that you really should be doing when you're a kid. But for me, it was more, did you do your 30 minutes of Anulom Vilom and Kapalabhati, your nostril breathing and your breath of fire? It's like, did you make sure you did that? Did you do your Jalneti where you, uh, Jalneti is a Kriya, so a cleansing technique. So you take saline water, like warm saline water, and you pour it through one nostril and it comes out the other. And that was something I basically, it was a non-negotiable. I had to do it every single day to help with my allergies and my asthma. So that's a lot of how yoga, I guess, these practices showed up in my life, at least when I can think of like my earliest memories of this being a regular practice. The chanting has always, I mean, just always been there. My parents are both Jain practitioners And so Jainism, like them both growing up in Jainism, you still have lots of mantra practices and rituals, but it's definitely quite different from Hinduism in a lot of different ways. And at the same time, they also were born and raised in India where Hinduism is a dominant culture where they lived. And so there's a lot of other cultural influences that weren't necessarily from their Jain traditions, but that they still kind of adopted and accepted. So just kind of growing up with this mixture of, you know, what are the Jain rituals and the way of life versus Hindu's way of life. And it all just kind of got mixed together, to be quite honest. Um, My parents weren't, I wouldn't say they were like very religious. They definitely had their rituals, but it didn't seem like they were extremely religious or, you know, adhered to all the things that they needed to adhere to in Jainism. But mantra was definitely something my mom always enjoyed. She has a really beautiful voice and she sings. And so that was just, I guess it was just kind of a constant. I mean, it still is. I'm so curious to know, because I have three kids, and (laughs) they've all gone. I know. Well, my youngest is 16 now, so they're like 16, 18, and 22. But around the age of 11, I don't know if I could have told them, all right, you need to go to yoga for this thing. Was there ever a time where you're like, oh, this is not what I want to be doing? Or was it just part of life? I mean, yes, literally all the time. I was like, this is not what I want to be doing. But um, I would say my rebellious years came a little bit after that time. I mean, which was good for me and for my parents because I was young enough for my mom to, you know, to say, this is what you need to do when you're done with school in fifth grade, like, or sixth grade, you need to go do this. Um, And my sister and I are super close in age. We're only 18 months apart, which created a lot of really interesting rivalry in some ways when we were younger. But at the same time, we were also just like super, super close. Just, I would say we definitely had our ups and downs in childhood. And now, I mean, now she's my best friend, but at that age, there was a sense of camaraderie. Like, even if we were fighting, it's like, okay, well, if I'm going to go do that, you have to come with me. And we're like, yeah, okay, fine. Like, I'm not just going to abandon you and make you go to this yoga class by yourself. So I think that also helped with the lack of rebelliousness because my mom just kind of grouped us together knowing we'd both benefit and we were, no one wanted to leave the other out high and dry. And so there wasn't, there wasn't really that much pushback, but I would say, you know, especially in the beginning, I I went knowing one that I had to, because my mom was telling me to, but two, I was just so tired of being sick all the time too. I wouldn't say I was as aware as I am now as an adult, but for being 11 or 12 years old and my sister and I both having a lot of food allergies and having asthma, I would say I was extremely hyper aware of like what I ate and what I did and what aggravated certain things probably more than my peers. And that hyper awareness led to a lot of 
it's like almost like a level of awareness you don't really want as a kid, you know, because you're just having to be like so on edge or careful, or is this going to like aggravate my asthma? But then can I go to my friends and sleep over and do they have a cat? Oh, I can't go there. You know, just like, you know, these aren't necessarily abnormal things, but when you're that young, you know, your parents want you to like be a kid and you want to be carefree. And that just was definitely not my experience. So I think this idea of being like, well, I just don't want to do that. One, it was not in my cultural upbringing, but two, there was also this other sense of like, yeah, like you're right. Yeah. I probably just need to go do that. So, but there, you know, there was a huge part of me that didn't want to. And the part that didn't want to was because I was afraid I was going to be judged by my by peers and my friends. I was going to be seen as weird. Being Indian was already really weird. And so I would just lie. I'm like, oh, what are you doing after school? And I'm like, oh, I have dance class <laughs> or I have something or, oh, I have to go to my cousin's house. I don't remember ever having the conversation with any of my classmates They're like, oh, I'm going to yoga after school. Whereas now a lot of kids I used to teach were in school environments and they're all fifth graders, fourth graders, you know, and they're they have all their friends doing yoga club with them. And it's, it's really amazing to see. And just so funny how for a lot of us South Asian teachers, like when we were kids, that was just not the norm, you know? So, yeah. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for sharing this, just this story. It's, it's making me think that your mom was really wise as well to also send you to a different teacher to be like, okay, you have to take <laughs> this over here with someone else. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> For our yoga teachers who maybe are in yoga teacher training or just coming out of a yoga teacher training or who didn't learn about mantra in their yoga teacher training, which does happen, sadly, tell us what is the definition of mantra? So mantra, it's pronounced with a short A, so man and not man. So man and then T-R-A and you roll the R. I mean, not everybody can. So you try your best to roll it. And the T is dental. So the T is like a soft T coming off the teeth. The. So mantra. And it's made up of two words. Man means mind and thra means to protect. So you put these two words together to create the word mantra, which means to protect the mind. Mantra? Yeah, mantra. Okay. Yeah. To protect the mind, that's what it translates to. Mm -hmm. And so what is a mantra then? So a mantra is made up of different sounds. And, you know, I can really only speak to the traditions that I've learned in because there's so much I don't know about mantra still. And there's probably so much I'll never know. And it also depends on what lineage you're learning in, you know, like what's, what's been passed down to you. So I even, you know, even the translation of the word mantra might vary from tradition to tradition, to some extent. I mean, I think in general, it still means to protect the mind, but I've heard people say it means to free the mind or some other like iteration of that as well. But um, a mantra is made up of different sounds and it's also pretty scientific. So Sanskrit in itself is a vibrational language and a scientific language. It's made up of syllables and sounds, not necessarily letters, although a lot of times people will call them letters in the alphabet because that's the way you know, English speakers will most easily connect to it, but it's really made up of sounds, um, kind of like in Spanish, how you have, you don't just have A, B, C, D, you have like a uh, or ba or ka or da, and um, sounds very similar in that way. So you have these syllables that create these sounds, and when you combine them in different ways, they have different kinds of effect on your system. So I would say for me, the question wouldn't be necessarily what is a mantra versus what kind of intended effect do you want the mantra to have? And is it always in Sanskrit or can we have English mantras? It's a really, really good question. That's a really good question because I think now there are a lot of non-South Asian teachers, I think, are afraid to ask that question of can I do this in English? And I will say I never, I, I growing up, I never learned like, oh, you can do um, this mantra in Sanskrit and do it in English and it'll have the same effect. I never, I personally, like I've never learned that, but, um, you know, now learning from some of my teachers right now, the Vinyo tradition, and most people in these trainings are Canadian or American and or Western European. So they've all like been kind of brought up in the West. And so they have, you know, Mr. Desikachar did pass down knowledge to them where you can, depending on where the individual you're working with is at and what they'll connect to the most, 
you can give them other kinds of sounds. And so my teacher gives the example of instead of om, you can give them shalom or amen, where there's a similar sound, but the meaning is something that the person might connect to more easily right away, but they're still getting the benefit of um, the vibration and the effect on their system. That would be one example. And I think you can definitely chant in English. I really would say it's not really about you. It's what is the student really needing and where are they at in their practice that they're going to connect to the experience the most. And maybe in the beginning, it'll be giving them something in English because maybe they have some previous trauma and it's very triggering to have something in a different language. I'm not sure. Right. But that could be one example. And then later on, you might give them something in Sanskrit after there's more trust that has been built between you and the student um, where you can offer them something in Sanskrit. So is it the same? I'm not totally sure. I can't really answer that. But I definitely think there's space for, you know, diverse experiences for sure. That's so interesting. Thank you for that. I'm wondering now, because we have an episode, I'm not sure when it's coming out on Kirtan. I don't know if I'm saying this correctly as well. Um, What is the difference then? Because I think when people think that they're chanting, they might think it's the same thing. Yeah. Another great question. You know, one of my, my mantra teacher actually just sat me down and told me her opinion on the difference between kirtan and mantra. And it's being completely lost on me right now. I cannot remember what she said right now for the life of me. But with kirtan, there's not quite as much attention, not always, but there's usually not necessarily attention on like, there's a certain meter that it's chanted in. And in Vedic, in Vedic mantra, for example, there are three notes that you oscillate between Girtan, you might take that same Vedic mantra and just make it a really different, beautiful melody. That's not at all what the what it was originally translated into or taught, but you might take like Om Namah Shivaya and take that out and make a whole song out of it. It's still really beautiful and people are definitely still deeply affected by it, but it's not the same thing. And I don't, I don't think that's necessarily good or bad. I think it's more how you use the tools. Some people, you know, Girtan is much more freeing and much more spacious and they don't feel like so structured. So they can kind of be there and have an experience. Is the mantra is intended to affect the same as when you're chanting in a totally different melody? I don't necessarily think so, but I think, I think intention is also really, really powerful. And you could chant the same mantra without the traditional Vedic melody and You know, there are a few different ways to go about this, but if you know what the mantra means, you can really connect to that meaning or to that feeling or to that deity and still get so much benefit, even if you're not chanting in this traditional Vedic format. But that's like my, you know, that's definitely one of my opinions on it. But there's also a whole other side of how Kirtan has been like totally co-opted in the West. It's like nothing like what it is when you go to India. And again, India is a massive country and incredibly diverse. And no one, even if they're from India, you know, no one can really speak to the entire country's experience, but you can speak to yours and the region that you're from or the or the regions that you have experience, you know, learning in, right? So it's also, I think, different depending on where you are in India. But my parents grew up in, in Kolkata, which is in West Bengal, which ironically is on the east side of India, but it's uh, on the eastern part of India. And the Girtans there, you know, you're repeating the same mantra or the same song over and over and over again. But there's still like a, I don't know how to explain it, but there's still like a container, if that makes sense, like the people who are leading it. And it's just, it's just really different from what you see a lot by white centered kirtans here, where even the, the sense of trying to pronounce things correctly are just kind of thrown out the window and, you really see the intention over impact. Like, well, as long as like, if I pronounce something like correctly or incorrectly, because, you know, I'm thinking about the meaning or I have a good intention. And that's where I think it gets taken too far because when you're in a position of power, especially as a white person in a wellness space, when you're in a position of power like that, what you do, other people model. And so when you do a kirtan and it's, you're calling it a kirtan, but There's no honoring of where you got the knowledge from or acknowledging your teachers or even trying to remotely pronounce things, how they kind of should be pronounced. When there's like no effort being put into that, I really see that more as, okay, but who is this actually serving? I'm not really sure. So those are like my, I guess those are my two kind of opinions on that. But 
I actually really enjoy gear them, but I would say in the last five years, it hasn't really become something I step into. And I think, but part of that, I think is because the only other times I've been to a gear then in the U S have all been led by white people who just had, you know, not much respect for, I wouldn't say the coach necessarily just the culture, but a sense of respect for, okay, it might take me a little extra time and be more inconvenient for me to try to learn how to pronounce these things or talk a little bit about what they mean and to talk about like where I got the knowledge from that might be more inconvenient for me, but it's still important that I do that. And I just, I never would see that. And so I've just, I've just never been back in one of those spaces, but I've met some great South Asian individuals who lead Kirtan and teach classes and stuff. And it's, it's kind of beautiful to see a reclaiming of that practice again. That's amazing. Let's dig into the pronunciation then. If yeah. Because already, you know, I'm thinking, oh gosh, am I saying even mantra? Like, I want to say mantra. I'm still doing it. And I appreciate that you're telling me the correct way to say it. And it does take me more time. So what about what happens? Or do we need to learn Sanskrit to use Sanskrit mantra? Yeah. Yeah. Good question. I think it's a balancing act because, you know, I grew up in the States as a first generation American, right, of Indian descent. And so did my husband, <laughs> yet he is 100% fluent in Hindi. Like if, when he speaks in Hindi, no one even knows that he was born here because his Hindi is just like so on point. And mine definitely is not. I, I can understand it, I can read and write it, and I can speak it within environments that I'm very comfortable in. Like if I, if I remotely feel like I'm going to be shamed or judged for my pronunciation, I probably will just revert to English because I feel so, I get really shy. And so I, I do think it's a balancing act because I mean, my pronunciation is like never perfect either. I teach a chanting class on Monday evenings and we started going through the Devanagari alphabet or the Sanskrit alphabet. And we started <laughs> just like how my mom used to do for me when I was younger she would recite all the sounds like ka, ka, ga, ka, mm, ja, cha, ja, ja, nya. And this is how you would learn in a class, right? So we started doing that because they said, if you have a sense of how the alphabet's organized and where the sound is being produced when you pronounce different things, um, different, different um, consonants and different vowels, it will also just amplify that experience for you when you're chanting because you'll be able to connect back to, oh, right, this is a guttural sound. So I can really feel the sound coming from the back of my throat. This is a retroflexive sound. I can really feel it, you know, in the back of my palate or my teeth or somewhere else. And so when you have like that foundational understanding, do you have to memorize the alphabet? I mean, I don't know. I think that's up to an individual's preference, probably not. But to have some understanding of it's not just, it's not random you know, it's organized in this really specific way intentionally. Is it important, I think, to learn how to pronounce things? Yeah, I definitely think it's important because especially um, for white teachers and white practitioners, for so long, these spaces have existed to center them. You know, not to center, definitely not me and pretty much not other BIPOC practitioners or teachers either. And so if those spaces are there to center white people, then there's also going to be less accountability because you can kind of get away with whatever. No one's going to stand up to you. No one's going to say anything. At least it's always kind of been like that for the most part. And now, at least in my experience, I can see that starting to change where there is some more accountability. And South Asian practitioners are getting more comfortable at the end of class saying to the teacher, well, actually, you know, it's actually pronounced like this. And this is really what it means. And whereas I would have not even dreamed of doing that when I used to go to classes in New York because there was such a established power differential there that I was always so afraid of getting like shut down or just being like totally rejected. Right. Um, so, I mean, all this to say, I do think there's a sense of balance that needs to be there because none of us are going to say anything completely perfectly, not in Sanskrit and not in any other language that's not native to us. So then I think my question is how do we take time, right? Like you were saying, that's it might take a little longer, might be less convenient. How do we prioritize that versus being perfect? I think I definitely see the difference when I'm in a class and the teacher is trying. You can see they're trying, putting an effort and they're not going to get it totally right. But you can, there's totally a difference when somebody's just, you have the sense of entitlement to the whole practice and you're like, whatever, I'm just going to say it however I want. And, or I'm going to say it really quickly. Therefore, I won't be able to pronounce it quickly. I'm just going to go say it really quickly. And 
like who's going to say anything to me, right? Where I think that that space or that thinking is starting to change because more and more South Asian teachers are standing up and saying, actually, it actually, it means something when you don't put in the effort and it's a microaggression and it does mean something and it does cause harm. So I would, I would say it's important, but I wouldn't say that not being able to pronounce something the perfect way is an excuse for not using it at all. So this is so good. I appreciate <laughs> that you said that you're not getting it correct all the time and that you're practicing and this whole idea of putting the effort in and and that making a difference. This is so helpful. What is the science behind mantra? I'm going to keep trying. Mantra. It sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> what? It's not great to me. Is my ear as well trained as my mom's? Probably not, but Um, Like last, I think two weeks ago or something in our chanting class, we were going over the alphabet. And I I think it was in that class where I told them, you know, it's not about us all get being perfect, but it's like, we're all just trying or making effort. And by doing that, we're honoring the practice. And I said, for example, I have a class every single week, uh, Monday morning, my mantra teacher, this past week, we're learning this super long to me, it feels very complicated to her. She's like chanting and it just sounds like a beautiful amazing thing. Right. And to me, I'm like, Oh my God, this is so tough. And there's so many different pronunciation rules you have to remember. And so what I do after those classes is I usually call my mom who lives in India. So by the time I'm done, it's like around the time she, she's like having dinner, like getting ready for bed. And so, Hey, it's time for bedtime mantra. You're going to sit down. You're going to listen to me practice this whole thing. And when I chant, it's really slow because I'm trying to figure it, you know, just like anybody where you're learning a different language and trying to say something in it, you're not just going to say it super fast. You have to kind of take your time. So it takes me a good, I would say like 15 minutes sometimes to get through some of the mantras I'm learning. And my mom's just sitting there <laughs> listening to, she's like the only person in the world. I, I mean, my husband will too, but after about 10 minutes, he kind of gets up and he's like, you're doing great. I got to go. Like, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> um, but my mom will just sit through it. I think sometimes she's secretly watching Netflix in the background. But she, um, the last time we chatted, I thought I did this like great job, right? I was like, oh, I learned this super long chat, blah, 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 blah. And I finished it. And then I was like, mom, what'd you think? And she, I told my students, my mom was just like, it was good. I was like, that's it? <laughs> it was just, it was just good. She was, yeah, it was good. You know? And, and when she says it, that's like a, that's a huge compliment, you know? She's like, it was good. And I'm like, okay, what, I, like, what did I do wrong? She goes, well, you know. You did well, but there were a lot of areas where, you know, you really need to work on your pronunciation, but, you know, you're learning and it's good. And, and I was just so like, I felt so like, um, like deflated, right? <laughs> just like, oh, <laughs> I thought, you know, I was like doing this great job, but I think that's also, I think it's a completely natural response for me, of course, but I think this is also part of the kind of like that Westernized culture of, you know, you do something and you should already be an expert at it. You should already be great at it. And then the next day you should totally just teach it. It's like, why should that be our goal? This is a lifelong journey. So wherever you are, where, you know, wherever you leave off that journey in your past life that you get to in your current life, that's just where you are, you know? And my, um, my husband, our, our music lineage that we study in our buddy Guruji, which means like a bigger, like senior guru, he used to say, I'm not going to get the quote totally right, but he used to say something like along that lines of, with music that you pick up from wherever you left off in your past life. So if that's true, and that's like the theory that we believe, then if you're picking up where you left off, then you're never behind and you're never further ahead of where you need to be. You're exactly where you're supposed to be because that's where you, that's where you ended in your last life. So if it, you don't come to these practices until you're 80 years old, then that's where you needed to come to those practices in this lifetime. For, you know, or if you started when you were eight years old or 10 years old and there's no, I'm so behind, you know, that's where you're supposed to be. And whenever I have a feeling and I practice the month there and I'm like, oh, it should be so much better. It's like, like, why do I think it should be so much better than it is? So I, I keep coming back to that when, especially when um, people ask about pronunciation, because I mean, I'm definitely not a total expert, you know, and I probably won't be ever. There are definitely lots of things that I'm practicing that I pause and I'm like, Asma, I'm like, he doesn't, he speaks Hindi, which is Sanskrit is a root language for Hindi. So there's definitely a lot of relationship there. And so I'll be like, oh, how do you pronounce this and this? And then he'll tell me. And I'm like, okay. And he's like, but he's like, when you say it, it doesn't sound like how I'm saying it. And I'm like, I know, I don't know why <laughs> I'm trying, <laughs> you know? So just to, I think there's um, a lot of times this misconception to South Asian that 
they'll know what all the Sanskrit words mean in yoga and about treating any kind of population, particularly BIPOC populations, like a monolith, as if they all relate to their culture in the same way, which we don't. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you, what is a mantra that you are really feeling connected to lately? Or what's one that you keep coming back to and why? Like, what are the benefits of that one? Yeah, that's a great question. I need a second to think on that, if that's okay. Mm Mm-hmm. Another question that I have for you, if you want to think on that in the back of your mind. Yeah. The other question I wanted to ask is, because when I was in yoga teacher training, my teacher was a naturopath and also studied kundalini yoga and really focused on the science of like where the tongue is landing in the mouth and how that impacts the body. Can you talk about that a little bit with mantra? Yeah. So my teacher, Chase, who learned from Mr. Desikachar, would always say how mantra is one of probably one of the most powerful tools in yoga. And it's also the most subtle. And then one of the reasons that it's one of the most powerful tools, because the belief is from, in a, from a yoga perspective, the belief is that all matter that exists is sound in itself. So the, the universe world was created through sound. When we talk about the Vedas, one of the stories is that the rishis or the sages, they heard, they heard the Vedas being chanted. It wasn't like they picked up a book. We're like, oh, great, Rig Veda, here we go. It was a sound that came to them. Um, And I think this idea is so powerful because it also means that it's a great entry point for people in their practice, I think. And not everyone necessarily will connect to mantra, but mantra is also, doesn't just have to be words that you pronounce and you say, it can also be a sound that you produce that can have a really significant impact. But when we're talking about the language and the vibrational effects, I'll just go back to how the alphabet is categorized. So it starts with vowels and vowels are obviously in a separate category, but one of the reasons it's a separate category is because when you say a vowel, right, your tongue doesn't make any hard contact with the mouth. If you just say, ah, your tongue's kind of just there hanging out, right? Whereas with consonants, there is some kind of contact happening with the mouth, whether it's through the tongue or the lips. So there's kind of a difference in those two kinds of sounds. Your consonants, they're grouped into these five slash six categories. So you have how the alphabet starts with consonants. It starts with sounds being made from the back of the throat. So it's like almost starting at the root of your voice. Okay. And then after that, the next sound is your palate and the back of the palate. Then after that, it goes closer to the front of the mat with the teeth, then with the lips and the nasal sounds. So there's like this, uh, this like arc or pathway of how everything is being organized. So from start to finish, the sound is being moved from the throat all the way up to the nasal cavity. There's also another model where the different sounds in the alphabet are connected to the different elements. And this is like a whole other way to look at it too, because when you think about the mantra being a science and applying it therapeutically, you can give an individual a certain mantra that has syllables that are more connected to earth. If you're wanting to give them some, if they're needing something that's more stabilizing or rooting or grounding or a mantra that has more syllables that have the wind element, if the person might be feeling stuck or have a lot of kapha in their system where things kind of need to move. Um, So this is another example about how they're really organized in these intentional ways to have a certain kind of effect on system. From like a meaning standpoint, you can have, I mean, there's so, so many mantras, but a lot of the ones I'll use therapeutically are short ones where you have a mantra like Om Shraddhaya Namaha. So it starts with Om, then the main word is Shraddha, and then it ends with Namaha. Namaha is as if to bow down to or salute something. And then Om is... I'm invoking the energy 
or the feeling of this particular word. Shraddha means to have a deep sense of trust or a sense of conviction or faith. So then when you're chanting Om Shraddhaya Namaha, what you're doing is you're invoking and bowing down to this idea of having such a deep sense of trust in what you believe in or what your path is or the decisions you need to make. So having this mantra say in your personal practice, not to say it's like magic and it'll just work overnight, but it's magic in a sense, because if you sit there and you really have your full attention on this mantra and you understand how to pronounce each of the letters in an appropriate way, it's organized in such a way to have that particular meaning or impact of what the meaning of the word is. What I'm trying to say is that you don't necessarily have to know what the mantra means to get its benefit. I think that there's a few different ways to learn it where one is without intellect. And so you give the mantra or you learn it and you learn by hearing it and you're responding and you're memorizing it that way. And then you're trying to understand where am I having the sensation or experience in my body? Like what is coming? And I think the meaning will come from that. There's also another way to learn where you understand the meaning of the mantra and then you're meditating on that meaning and you're trying to invoke or bring it in as you chant. And I think different ways are appropriate for different people. That's amazing. I'm wondering now because I know you work as a yoga therapist. Do you bump into where people feel uncomfortable chanting or have questions about it, like wondering, well, what does this really mean or where they feel like it might be bumping up against their beliefs or their religion? How do you deal with all of those thoughts when you work with people? Yeah, it definitely does happen, especially depending on the environment I'm working into. And it it actually happens quite a bit. I think more recently, some of the clients I've started working with have come specifically because they know that I practice mantra and it's something they're wanting to learn. And so that, um, for lack of a better word, that barrier isn't necess- for them, like, isn't necessarily there, but barrier is not really the right word because I think people are where they are, but that is not necessarily like the experience they're having because they're already, they already have some kind of buy-in and they already know this is thing they want to practice. But I do also work at a clinic and I see patients there as well. And you'll see this a lot because one, people have been through a lot in that when they come to that clinic, they will have a lot of really complex, like complex conditions, things they're dealing with in terms of their mental health, PTSD. And they're really coming to this integrative clinic because we're offering, you know, a different way of seeing things and a different way of doing things that may, they may not have tried before. So I definitely see this a lot, especially living in the South that many people I work with have, you know, a deep, deep belief in their Christian faith. And sometimes I will see this where they will either want the meaning right away to make sure it's not conflicting with their beliefs, or they might not want to do it at all. But I would say what I come across more is people wanting to understand intellectually what something means before you chant it. I I do think that's natural because that's also the kind of just how our society functions. You know, this idea of being in your body and having an experience and letting the meaning kind of come to you. It's not really something I think many of us are conditioned to be able to do right off the bat, um, which has just been kind of my experience in my own body and also working with people. So I do think it's it's kind of a natural response I, I get. I get pretty frequently. And depending on the person I'm working with and what I feel like might be the safest approach for them, I might say, are you willing to just sit with the mantra for the few weeks in your practice and just see what comes? And then we could talk about the meaning in our next session or in a couple of weeks. And sometimes, sometimes I'll ask that. And sometimes people will be like, sure, absolutely. I, they'll, they'll understand, oh, there, there is a value to having the experience first and intellectualizing something later. Um, and then for some people, I, I might feel like that's not the best route. And that actually might be more of a hindrance for them in their practice. And so I might offer a general meaning and I'll say we can get more into the nitty gritty in a few weeks, but this is the general idea. They feel a little bit more supported. So I do, I do think it depends. I don't have any particular, you know, negative or positive opinion on the fact that people have that response. Cause I do think, you know, we're all coming to the spaces of our different life experiences and different ways that we're conditioned. So I think it's a natural response, but you know, I've had a few people here and there that have kind of downright, rejected it and not, not in, like in more in a group setting where they, you know, not participate or um, will be looking you know, over angry and frustrated that 
I had the audacity to say something in Sanskrit or in Hindi and not explain everything first. I definitely see that for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is really interesting to hear your take on this in different settings that you teach in. Thank you for sharing that. Where can our listeners learn more? Do you teach chanting and mantra that they could attend? Or do you have some resources that you would suggest? Yeah, thank you so much for that. I do teach a regular drop-in class on Mondays at 4.30 p.m. Central, it's 5.30 Eastern. And you can find all all of that on my website, which is findyourbreath.net. And there's a schedule on there with some of the classes that I teach. So do have that weekly class, which is open to everyone at all levels. We do have a particular month where we work on usually from four to six weeks. So a lot of times people will try to come pretty regularly so they can continue to build and, and work on the mantra. But even if people just drop in, it's completely fine because we always review the mantra every class. So it's not something that you have to kind of stick to for a month straight or anything. Um, but I do a class on Mondays. And then I also have an online library that people can subscribe to. Uh, there's a pricing for a community rate and a standard rate. And in that, in that library, you know, I have pranayama practices, asana practices, meditation practices. All of them have some chanting in there. And then I have a whole mantra library that I'm working on just making more robust and building where if live classes are one, not your thing slash it's just, you know, kind of hard to schedule around that, depending on where you are. The library is a great option because the recordings, many of them, especially the shorter ones have call and response style. So I recorded them by chanting and then leaving space for you to practice. And then I chant the next line. So it's a great way to still get the experience of being in a class where you get to do that call and response style and learn, um, but more on your own time. And the best thing about the recordings that you can always rewind it and practice it again and again and again. So those are two options and both are available on my website. That's amazing. I'll make sure that we link to that in our show notes. Thank you so much for your time today, all of your wisdom around this, and for just kind of giving us an introduction and then way beyond that as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shannon. Do you mind if we close with a chant? Yeah, I would love that. Great. Awesome. Oh, yeah, Dakshara Pada Prashta Matra Hi Nantu Yad Pavet. Tat Sarvangsham Yatan Deva Narayananam Postute Shri Mate. Narayanaya namo namaha kaye navacha manasendri yerva puthyat manava prakrite svabhavat karomi atyat sakalam parasmai narayanaye te samar payami sarvam Shri Krishna Arpanamastu. Thank you so much for that. Do you want to tell us what chant that was and anything about it? Yeah. So there are two chants. The first one is called Krama Shlokam. And the second one is called Sattvika Tyagaha. And so the first month, the Krama is like to, um, asking for forgiveness. And so it's just to end the practice by asking from our teacher's and beyond for just any forgiveness for any mistakes that we might have made in our journey learning. And then the second, the sattvika, tyagaha, is a way of not grasping or hoarding all the benefits we got from our practice. So what the benefits that we receive, we also release that to others in our community and beyond that. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Thanks, Shannon. goodness thank you so much for all of this Melissa checking out your website as I was doing some just linking and getting all of the notes ready and I just want to say connected yoga teachers go and check out Melissa's website and definitely check out her membership Melissa has a full library including pranayama classes meditation classes mantra recordings call and response style. That's what she was referring to. I'll make sure that we link to this in the show notes as well. It looks amazing. It's put together so well. And just thank you. Thank you for this, Melissa. 
and connected yoga teachers, I would love to hear your thoughts or your favorite mantras that you use or your questions either in our Connected Yoga Teacher Facebook group or in the show notes underneath in the comments that you can find over at theconnectedyogateacher.com slash 242. And Connected Yoga Teachers, as I said, next week on the podcast, we get to talk with Chase Bossart about what yoga texts to read. I'm really excited about this episode. We had a lot of fun recording it and I can't wait until we can release it. So make sure you're subscribed so that you don't miss an episode. We release one each and every Monday. It is time to sign off, but first I want to thank our entire team over here, Suzanne, Crunch, Sinead, Erica. Thank you so much for all of the work that you're doing for our Connected Yoga Teachers. And also thank you for listening It means so much that you are spending your time here today, learning, listening, hanging out. And I am super curious to know what you might be doing this week to stay connected to yourself, your yoga practice, and to your community so that you can share the yoga that lights you up.